In this video, I'm going to explain how you use the Jacobian. I went over the theory of why it makes sense in this video here. Um, and also, stay, make sure you stay till the end because there is an important concept about uh, how the transformed region is oriented and how that can affect the answer. So if you make a substitution in multiple integrals, then that's going to transform the space and that's going to change the area or the volume of the object. So if you want to know what the answer in the original space was, you're going to have to scale your answer by some amount. And here's the formula for doing that. We call it the Jacobian. Um, and it's the amount that you have to rescale the area by uh, if you make a substitution. Before I get started solving an actual Jacobian problem, I just want to go over this video very useful formula. You don't have to use this formula in order to solve these problems. You can just do like a regular old college algebra techniques in order to get these answers. But this formula is really useful um, and you're gonna use it in other classes. It tells you how to find uh, inverse of a two by two matrix. So I have a transformation set up here um, and I can view this transformation as uh, vectors and matrices. So. Another way to view this transformation is um, where you take the coefficients and you make a matrix out of them, and then uh, we write it in this way. I really like writing it in this way. In my mind, this really makes it look like y equals mx. Um, okay, so what we want to do is use these formulas in order to produce uh, the inverse matrix of it. Here, here it is right here. So you do like one over the determinant, and then you switch these diagonals. You can see it was AD, and then you switch their places. Um, and then you change the signs along those diagonals. So let's start, I'm gonna name this matrix A. Let's start by finding the determinant of A. So I'm just gonna do this diagonal right there. So I am getting uh, 15 minus seven. Uh, so that is gonna be eight. Okay, so we got the determinant is eight. So this means that A inverse is going to be one over eight times. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch the A and the D. So I'm gonna put a negative five there and a negative three there. And then you change the signs of the other one. So negative seven there, negative one there. Um, so the conclusion of this is our new, uh, our new matrix equation could be written this way, um, one over eight times, sorry, there's construction noise outside, negative five, negative one, negative seven, negative three times UV is equal to XY. You can see I've just moved this A to the other side over there and made it A inverse. I've multiplied both sides by A inverse. Um, so if we look at this in terms of just like we just pull out the top equation and pull out the bottom equation, this is gonna mean that negative five over, oops, negative five over eight U minus seven over eight V is equal to X and negative one over eight u minus three over eight v is equal to y. Um, so there it is. We started off with an equation that takes an x, y, and it gives you a u, v, uh, and using this nice little formula there, I ended up with an equation that takes a u, v input and spits out an x, y. So. Um, you know, so this is fantastic. And, and you use this in other classes as well, you know, so get used to this formula. It's really save you a lot of time. Okay, so I got a pretty typical Jacobian type problem here. Um, so I'm given this transformation, you know, and anytime somebody gives me a transformation in a Jacobian problem, I'm going to immediately use this inverse matrix formula to produce this inverse transformation. I, I, I think that's pretty fast. You know, if you need to uh, pause the video and, and do that formula out to see where I got this formula from right there. Um, and then they give me an integral. So this is the integral that I'm trying to calculate. And then they give me a bunch of lines down here um, that give me the region uh, that I'm integrating over. So this, the interior of this region right here is R. Um, and they've done, they've done their best to make up a problem um, that really requires the Jacobian. You can see if we tried to use the laser beam method 
um, then this isn't going to work very well at all because over here I'm going to get one set of enter exits and then right here I'm going to get another set of enter exits and then right there I'm going to get yet another set of enter exits. So if I was going to try to calculate this uh, integral in xy space I would have to separate it up into three different integrals. Um, so I'm going to start this problem by uh, this right now. This is x, y space. So I'm going to start this problem by uh, transforming the region into UV space. It turned out to be pretty easy. Um, you know, I, all I did was here, I took this equation and I cleared the denominator. So I just multiplied everything by 3. And then I moved the 2x over to the other side. So um, so it's, it's 3x plus 2y equals 3. Uh, sorry, 3y plus 2x equals 3. And you can see that is exactly u right there. So one of my uh, boundaries just turned into this line right here. u is equal to 3. Um, and then the rest of them just came out in this nice way right here. I have 3y plus 2x. So this one is really u is equal to 6, right? x, pl x plus 4y, this is really v equals 0. And right here, this one is really v equals 1. Um, you know, so, so this problem has really been constructed in a very friendly way to allow this transformation to happen easily. So it's nice, right? It takes our very ugly kind of like a parallelogram um, region and it turns it into a nice little rectangular region. Um, okay, so we only have two things left to do. Now I need to calculate this Jacobian and then somehow I need to switch this integral into UV space as well. So let's do the Jacobian first. Okay, so the Jacobian was pretty easy. Um, you know, here, th this is really where our inverse matrix formula is going to shine. See, I have here x is equal to 4 over 5 times u. And what goes in the formula right there is del x del u. So all you need to do is take the partial derivative of x with respect to u and put it right there. Take the partial derivative of x with respect to v and put it right there. So you see, I mean, it 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 really, when you look at it in this way, it is really transparent. You know, when you, you basically just take the coefficients out, it's kind of one of the nice things about these simple linear transformations. And then you just do this determinant formula, right? That one, that product minus that product. So I got one over five. Fantastic. Um, we're really almost done. Now all I need to do is work out what this integral is in UV space. Okay, uh, it's pretty, it's nice. Um, look, it, it factors. Um, so this this original thing inside the integral there, I factored it. Look, and if you just do, you can just check really fast. If I do this, I'm going to get 2x squared. Uh, and then for the, for the mixed terms here, I'm going to get 8xy plus 3xy, and that is going to give me 11xy. Uh, and then when I do 3y times 4y, I am going to get 12y squared. Um, so that this problem is really, you know, they've, they've, they've lined up all the little pieces so it comes out really nice because this is just u times v. Okay, so we've done all the work. Um, the last thing to do here is to just set up this integral in uv space. Fantastic. How how excellent was this? So, um, you know, just to match all the pieces around, dA here in xy space became j times du dv. So, um, uh, when we transformed into UV space, um, things got bigger, I guess. I didn't, my drawing's not to scale, so we've got to rescale it back down um, in order to uh, keep our answer the same in XY space. And then this thing on the inside here was just UV, so that just became UV. And then the region that I'm integrating over um, in UV space is just this little rectangular region, you know, so that's that's the easiest laser beam ever to set up. You just U goes between zero, uh, 3 and 6, and V goes between 1 and 0. Okay, so that's fantastic. We're not actually done here. There is one more subtle point about the orientation of these because um, I may have I may have flipped this over and so positive regions may have turned into negative regions. So let's let's have a look at at, at how this orientation issue could affect these problems. Like all things in Calc 3, if you're ever confused about a situation, what you need to do is just bounce back to Calc 1 and remember how things work in Calc 1 and then just copy and paste that into Calc 3. Um, so this is the way that reversing the orientation looked in Calc 1. The, okay, 
when you're doing an integral, <laughs> the way that we do integrals is we put the little number on bottom and the big number on top, okay? And then the orientation is we're integrating from left to right. That's just the same way that numbers go. <laughs> All right, but if somebody ever gave it to you backwards, then what you do is you put a negative out front and you switch those so that they're the right way again. And the reason that this works is just because of the definition of Riemann integration. Delta x, if you take a little delta x on the x-axis, the definition of it is x2 minus x1. So if you're ever integrating in the wrong way, what that means is all of your delta x's are going to be negative because you're going to be doing little number minus big number. So, um, you know, that's that negative right there. So if you're ever integrating in the wrong direction, you could just change the order that you're integrating in and put a negative in front and you'll still get the same answer. All right, so let's use that theorem to make sense of this example. I am going to make a stupid U sub here, but um, it's going to reverse the orientation. So I, what I've done is I've just taken this basic integral right there, and I've made the substitution U is equal to negative X. So if X is equal to zero, U is equal to zero. And now here's the important part. If X is equal to one, then u is equal to negative one. Okay, so um, fine, right? I mean, so now du will be negative dx. So there I have traded that out right there. And then u will be negative x. So here I have substituted out the x. And then I end up with this integral right here, which is the integral from zero to negative one of u du. So, so this, it's happened. OK, we have ended up here with an integral where, you know, the little number is supposed to be on bottom and, and negative one is the little number and it's on top. Um, so I use the theorem here and I pulled this negative out front and I, and I switched the order there. So um, this integral right there is equal to that integral right there. And, and basically what's going on here is if you ever end up with a negative dx, then that's going to reverse the order of integration. And what you're going to have to have is another negative out front. So in our problem, basically what's going on here is we have like j is equal to negative one. And then in order to account for that negative one, in order to get the orientation back in the correct direction, you need another negative out front. So, um, you know, just, just to tip my hand a little bit about what's going on here, this is the way that absolute value behaves, right? If, if you have a negative object, and you need to put another negative out front, then um, that, that's what absolute value does, right? It, it puts a negative in front of negative objects. So let's just check and see that I've uh, that this does actually work here and we get the right answers. So this is going to be 1 half x squared evaluated from 0 to 1, which is 1 half, right? Okay, just plug those in and you're going to get 1 half. Now over here, this one is going to be negative. So I'm going to get I'm going to get one half u squared, and this is going to be evaluated from negative one to zero. So this is going to be negative one half times, now you plug in the top one, zero squared minus negative one squared. Okay, so this is this negative right there and that negative right there are going to cancel out and you're going to get positive one half back. So the reason that this worked, what happened was I changed the, the orientation. I'm now integrating in the backwards direction because of my substitution. What I needed to do was I needed to account for that by putting a negative out front. All right, so let's bounce back to uh, the Jacobian and see how we can make sense of this in multiple integrals. So let's bounce back to the example that we just did um, and let's check and see if the orientation got reversed. So here's how you check and see if the orientation got reversed. So all I've done here is I've just I've just labeled my boundary points A, B, and C, and D. And so let's look at them uh, and see where they go. So A and B are both the downward, well, they're both, they're the, the slope negative uh, two over three. Um, so that is gonna be the more C point. So this is A over here and that's B over there because uh, B is the taller one of them. And then this, let's see. So this one down here is gonna be C and that one up there is gonna be D because uh, the lower one is uh, situated lower. All right, so when I walk around this region, if I started at A and I walked around the boundary of the region in the counterclockwise direction, I would go A, C, B, D. Okay, so let's look and see where they go. So 
A gets transformed into the line U is equal to three. So this is A. Uh, B gets transformed into the line U is equal to six. So this is B. Uh, C gets transformed into the line uh, V equals zero. So this is C right here. And D gets transformed into the line V equals one. So if I walked around this one starting at A, I would also go A, C, B, D. Um, so this orientation is preserved. OK, it didn't get reversed. It didn't. You know, it's possible if C and D were switched here for this to uh, to for this orientation to be walking around in the other direction. And that didn't happen. And you can know that that didn't happen because this Jacobian is positive. So what would have happened if you reverse the orientation is that means that the, the surface would have gotten flipped over. So so we would have had a negative volume out front. Um, so, uh, so what, what would that mean? That would mean that you would either have to reverse the orientation again, uh, back in your other integral, or you could just put a negative out front of it. Okay. So if this number would have come out negative in front of it, then I would have just had to put another negative out front of it in order to cancel it out. So there's an easy way to account for that. All you need to do is Whenever you're calculating the Jacobian, just make sure that you put absolute value signs around your Jacobian and that just like just completely solves this issue. And then you don't have to worry about whether or not the orientation got reversed. So um, fantastic. So, you know, the takeaway here is uh, orientation is kind of a complicated thing. And what you need to do is make sure that you always just put an absolute value sign around your Jacobian to account for perhaps the orientation getting reversed.